Greetings from the campus of the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. I'm Susie Quintana with the Teleconference Network of Texas and today's program moderator. Welcome to the Redis in Acción Emergency Protocol and Cancer Trainings. Before I turn over to our speakers today, I want to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's web event. We do want to keep things very informal, so there's a couple of ways that you can participate. Um, you will be able to uh, type in any questions or comments through your webinar control pane, and uh, those will be immediately submitted to myself, and I can will pass those along to our speakers. Or you can raise your virtual hand um, if you are connected uh, via a computer mic or headset, and I will unmute your line, and you can uh, dialogue with the speaker um, directly. If at any time anyone is having any problems uh, of any kind, please go ahead and type into the questions pane as well, and, uh, and I can address those and get you some assistance as soon as possible. Uh, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our uh, first speaker, and that, uh, that would be Ms. Sandra San Miguel. Sandra? Thank you, Susie Quintana. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Sandra San Miguel from the Health Science Center in San Antonio, Texas, research instructor um, with Redis and Exion and project coordinator for the San Antonio site. You are joining the Redis Emergency Protocol and Cancer Training. Um, we are very fortunate today to have Dr. Frank Benedo to give us the emergency protocol training as well as trainings on uh, colorectal cancer and prostate cancer. Um, for this given research project that we're going to work on, we are also going to be focusing on um, breast cancer patients. The training for the breast cancer will be conducted uh, in a separate training, and I'll send you all the details pertaining to that training within the next few days. So having said that, um, I welcome my team from San Antonio. I have Edgar Munoz, our statistician. Hi. <laughs> I also have uh, Guadalupe Cornejo, who's going to serve as the patient navigator. Hello. We also have on the line um, Emily Argo from Live Strong Foundation. And we also have our representatives from the Miami site, uh, Dr. Frank Panetto, Maria Barrero, who's going to be the project coordinator at the site and Carmen Lenarte, who's going to serve as the patient navigator. Having said that, I just want to um, mention that the purpose of the training is to give everybody a brief overview on the emergency protocol procedures to be taken in case of emergency. We will be administering a, psycho, a study battery, which includes multiple psychosocial scales which may represent some anxiety for some people. We really do not expect anything to happen, but if in case something happens, we just want to be prepared. Therefore, the training has been developed with the purpose of getting us ready as far as what steps to take in case that a study participant may have a um, potential um, mental health breakdown. Having said that, thank you everybody for joining and I'll pass the call on to uh, Dr. Panetto who is going to be kind enough to give us the first training on emergency protocol procedures. Dr. Panetto, if you could um, go ahead and select the uh, show screen option so we can view your PowerPoint and we'll be ready to go. Okay. Uh, Excellent. You yes, sir. You're good to go. Thank you. Great. And thank you, Sandra, uh, for the introduction. And I did want to mention that I'm going to go ahead and start first with uh, cancer training, and then we'll do the emergency protocol. So I wanted to switch things up a little bit. Um, so again, welcome, everyone. Thanks for making the time to be with us today. Uh, what I'm going to do first, I'm going to cover some points in uh, some critical points in Hispanic cancer survivorship and more specifically in prostate and colorectal cancer, which are two of the three target populations that we'll be uh, engaging in our protocols. Uh, then we'll move into the emergency uh, protocol training. I do want you to keep in mind that 
uh, this is more of an overview to gain a better understanding of the survivorship experience for both prostate and colorectal cancer patients. Uh, I know you're aware of this, but it's always helpful to mention or provide a disclaimer that uh, we're not physicians, we're not the medical staff, and uh, when uh, our participants raise issues, questions, or concerns that are more of a medical nature, we always refer them back to the medical team. But nonetheless, it's uh, good to have a general understanding of what the survivorship experience is going to be like for them and what are the treatments like, what is the course of recovery from treatment, and what are some of the quality of life issues that they're likely to experience. So let me begin by just going over um, some of the, let me see how I can get my slides. Here. There we go. So just some general issues in Hispanic cancer survivorship. We know that there are significant screening disparities and that may account to some extent why uh, some Hispanics present with more advanced disease, uh, particularly in cancers like lung and bronchial cancer. Uh, but less attention and less knowledge is available on what is the survivorship experience like. We know that Hispanics in general uh, have a series of contextual barriers like financial limitations, lack of insurance, language barriers, uh, legal status issues that may limit their access to follow-up care. And that may place them at a compromise when it comes to recovering from uh, cancer treatments. We also know that even if you take into account insurance that Hispanics as well as African Americans receive less aggressive and optimal treatments, and we're not quite sure why that is the case. Not surprisingly, we also find that Hispanics and other minorities also report poor health-related quality of life post-treatment and less treatment satisfaction, and that they're also more likely to have a slower recovery to their baseline functioning or their functioning right uh, before treatment, and that all these factors put together lead to greater interpersonal disruption, particularly with a partner, a spouse, or within the family, given the importance of the extended family network in the Hispanic uh, community. Uh, we've known for some time that uh, Hispanics and other minorities voice a great need for psychosocial services. This is a, a fairly influential study that showed that relative to non-Hispanic whites, African American and Hispanic uh, cancer survivors express significantly greater desire to receive more psychosocial services geared towards stress management, coping with sadness, being able to communicate or express their thoughts and feelings about the disease, and particularly greater worries about the family and how the disease was affecting uh, the family structure. And we also know from quite a bit of uh, work, mostly in the breast cancer literature, that Hispanics may to some extent engage in some psychosocial processes that could render them at a greater risk of experience, experiencing poor psychological adjustment when facing the chronic disease. And this occurs due to greater perceived stress and disease burden uh, to some extent less controllability or self-efficacy or perceived control over dealing with their illness and the treatment for the illness, uh, more fatalistic attitudes about the disease scores, uh, particularly in cancer, thinking that cancer, even if it's a very early stage and it's successfully treated, that it's still a death sentence, and uh, less motivation to adopt behavioral changes unless they see the benefits to the family and greater resilience on the family which can be very protective if the family is in place, but if you run into individuals who are socially isolated or have strengths with the family, this becomes uh, a risk factor. I do want to also mention that despite uh, the fact that this has been documented in several Hispanic populations, uh, that we shouldn't uh, stereotype the Hispanic community. There's many Hispanics who cope really well with chronic disease who don't have these fatalistic attitudes who rely fairly well with the family, even if it's a small network or even if they're isolated. But this is more rather to, for us to be in tune as to what are some of the factors that may interfere with uh, recovery from treatment. So some work has actually documented what are the needs of Hispanic and Latino cancer survivors. And uh, in the study by Beck York back in 2008, uh, their group was able to document what are some of the needs uh, or information needs that Hispanics uh, raise. And if you look at this graph, we can find that learning about tests and treatments uh, are very important 
health promotion strategies, how to stay fit, how to engage in better nutrition, uh, how to follow up with their uh, treatment recommendations, and interpersonal emotional uh, concerns and needs were also raised. And of course, insurance, which as we know Hispanics have a great disadvantage uh, by the fact that they have some of the lowest rates of insurance across ethnic groups. So again, quite a bit of evidence suggesting what are some of the needs of the Hispanic community and what are some of the salient factors that may impact how Hispanics adjust uh, to cancer diagnosis and treatment. Well, in our study, we're going to target some of the most common cancers in males and females. And if we look at the Hispanic community, and these are uh, American Cancer Society rates, we find that if we look at uh, incidence of uh, cancer, prostate and colorectal are the most common non-skin cancers in Hispanic males, while breast and colorectal are the most common in Hispanic females. If we look at cancer-related deaths, colorectal and prostate among males are second and fourth leading causes of death, while breast cancer and colorectal are the first and third leading cause of death among uh, Hispanic cancer survivors. So we're definitely targeting very common cancers and cancers that are among the leading causes of death for our community. I mentioned earlier the issue of late presentation. And in colorectal and prostate, we don't seem to find significant disparity in late presentation. In female, in female breast cancer, however, we do find that Hispanics are more likely to present with uh, regional disease relative to non-Hispanic whites. Um, looking at the five-year cancer-specific survival rates, the rates are also not that different as much as you would expect given some of the challenges that the community faces. Um, so if we look at prostate cancer, the rates are fairly comparable, although some are although a little bit lower than it is for non-Hispanic whites. Colorectal rates are significantly lower for Hispanics. And if we look at breast and colorectal in females, breast cancer survival rates are significantly lower for Hispanic females. Colorectal rates are, are fairly similar. So we do find a, a, a significant disadvantage in terms of survival, particularly when we look at colorectal in males and uh, uh, breast in females. In terms of some of the factors that may account for uh, this disadvantage that we see, I mentioned that socioeconomic and health factors can play a role. If we look at these socioeconomic characteristics and we look at all Hispanics, we definitely see that Hispanics have a greater financial disadvantage evidenced by greater levels of Hispanics being in poverty relative to non-Hispanic whites. Of course, language is a barrier, particularly for the more recent immigrant communities and some of uh, the communities where we're recruiting from. And if we look at healthcare access, particularly for younger Hispanics, those less than age 65, uh, no health coverage is a major concern. Keep in mind that about 50% of breast cancer cases are diagnosed before the age of 65. So that's a significant proportion of the uh, breast cancer survivorship population. Uh, with prostate and colorectal, the majority of cases are going to be older uh, men for prostate and older men for men for colorectal. So let's move into each uh, specific uh, disease. And I also like to mention, if you have any questions, please feel free to raise your voice, interrupt, raise your hand, or in some, some way alert me to, to it, and I'll be glad to address that as we're moving along. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more specifically about both prostate and colorectal cancer. So prostate cancer is the second leading cause of uh, cancer-related death. One in six men will develop uh, prostate cancer in their lifetime, and 80% of the cases occur over the age of 65, so it's a very, very common cancer. In 2010, there were about 223,000 cases of prostate, prostate cancer diagnosed and about 29,000 deaths. In fact, it's such a common cancer that about 41% of all male cancer survivors and 19% of all survivors, all cancer survivors, are, have been diagnosed and treated for prostate cancer. The good news with prostate cancer is that the vast majority of these cases are diagnosed at early stages, about 85% the cases, and they have about a 100% survival rate, or fairly close to 100%. The treatments, however, uh, 
the cost of that is that the treatments are associated with significant decrements in multiple aspects of quality of life. Surgery and radiation are the most common treatments for localized disease. And as you well know, uh, radiation of the prostate gland or removal of the prostate gland is associated with sexual dysfunction and urinary dysfunction, which are great areas of concern for prostate cancer survivors. If we look at advanced disease, uh, in that case, the news is not as promising. Although it's only about 50% of all cases, these men will have at best about a 32% survival rate five years from diagnosis. And in addition to that, the course of treatment for them, which is androgen deprivation, tends to be very challenging and compromising. And I will talk about some of the specific uh, treatment side effects of androgen uh, deprivation. I should mention that uh, prostate cancer, in many ways, is one of the more complex cancers in the sense of uh, screening uh, challenges and treatment decisions and how to actually treat the cancer. So we see a lot of different approaches at treatment. In many cancer centers across the U.S., we're finding that more and more men who are diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer are receiving a course of androgen ablation treatment. And uh, that's done uh, as a precaution in the event uh, that the cancer may spread following treatment for localized disease. Uh, and what that leads to is that you're going to get, in addition to the compromises associated with surgery and radiation, you also get the treatment side effects of androgen ablation. Uh, this is just, again, representing where prostate cancer stands relative to other cancers. Again, 19% of all cancer survivors. 41% of all male cancer survivors, so again, a very common disease. Uh, but let me just say a few words about the prostate gland. Uh, we, we tend not to think much about the prostate, especially if you're an older man and you're thinking about the chances that you have in terms of uh, developing prostate cancer or other diseases of the prostate. But uh, the prostate gland, as you can see right here, it's located right underneath uh, the bladder by the rectum. And uh, the main purpose or the main uh, function of the prostate is to produce seminal fluid and also to produce uh, or stimulate male hormone growth. Um, many older men, in fact, most older men at the age of 65 or older, are going to experience a condition we refer to as benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is an inflammation of the prostate. It's a normal course of uh, the aging process. Uh, the tissue grows. And what happens is it begins to interfere with the urethra, which goes right through the prostate, and it can lead to urinary dysfunction, like urinary frequency, waking up nocturnal, which is waking up in the middle of the night, having to urinate a frequent times, uh, not being able to empty the bladder adequately, so having to return to the bathroom. A whole series of consequences, which can mimic prostate cancer. What happens with prostate cancer is that obviously there's a development of a carcinoma within the cell. When the prostate cancer is treated through radiation or through surgery, there is an area uh, which is not very well depicted in this next image, but it's basically an area that we call the neurovascular bundle. And this bundle basically involves a series of nerves and uh, capillaries that provide uh, nerve nerve signals to uh, the prostate gland, the bladder, the urethra, the testes, and the penis. And this neurovascular bundle is associated with urinary function, with sexual function. And what happens to treatment, even in nerve sparing treatment, there is damage to the tissue of that neurovascular uh, bundle. And that's what's going to lead to the urinary dysfunction and the sexual dysfunction that we see men treated for prostate cancer. So again, it's tissue that's surrounding the prostate that has very important components or functions in terms of controlling urination, co controlling the sexual response, but that treatment is going to be, uh, that tissue is going to be affected by radiation and by surgery. You all have probably heard about nerve sparing surgeries. And this is a more sophisticated approach at removing the prostate through surgery and while individuals who have nerve sparing surgery tend to have less compromises in terms of sexual function and urinary function, the compromises are still significant, they're still there. 
Um, so given uh, the, the treatment-related side effects, so more can try to identify, so what are the correlates of distress and localized prostate cancer? What is it about the treatment that would lead to significant levels of anxiety or significant levels of depression? And uh, this is something to keep in mind when we're working with our population because these are going to be risk factors, if you will, uh, for psychological distress. Premorbid psychological functioning and comorbidities are critical. We know that men who present with a history of depression, a history of anxiety, or a history of personality problems, uh, narcissism, antisocial personalities, histrionic personalities, where they put a lot of emphasis on body image and sexuality, these men are going to have greater compromises in their emotional well-being because they're already starting at a deficit. Comorbidities are also going to be a problem. Men who have diabetes, who have hypertension, these men are already taking medications that compromise their sexual functioning. You compound that by treatment for prostate cancer, and sexual functioning is going to be incurred even further. So treatment-related functioning limitations, whether it's sexual dysfunction, whether it's urinary dysfunction, which, as you can imagine, can create a lot of anxiety, depression, social isolation, given the challenges associated with going to a theater, going to a movie, going to a party, and having to be worried about urinary leakage or having to go to the bathroom repeatedly. This can lead to depression and anxiety in, in, our, in our men. And, of course, recurrent disease. Men who progress during the, the course of prostate cancer are more likely to experience significant levels of distress. We're going to talk about psychological distress and cancer in the next set of slides or the next presentation. But I do want to mention that for these men, most of the distress experience is anxiety and depression. So a lot of psychosocial factors have been related to good adjustment. And what we mean by good adjustment, post-treatment, we refer to good quality of life, good emotional well-being, better social functioning, and factors like optimism, good social support, ability to cope effectively with stressors, having controllability, being able to manage stress have all been associated with better quality of life. But again, we know that there's several risk factors that can compromise quality of life further, high perceptions of stress, illness-related disruption, like I mentioned, that urinary and sexual dysfunction, treatment-related worries, men who may be progressing through the disease, and negative uh, personality traits are uh, problematic. If we look at Hispanics specifically, uh, not a lot of work has actually evaluated uh, Hispanic prostate cancer survivors, but the work that is available, although limited in sample size and communities, it does suggest that there may be some evidence uh, surfacing that Hispanic men may be diagnosed with more advanced disease at diagnosis. If we look at ACS and NCI rates, they're not reflecting that yet, but some individual studies do suggest that it may be a selection bias, in terms of men that are willing to come to the studies, but we're beginning to see some evidence of that. We do know that they're less likely to achieve baseline functioning, meaning that they don't recover as well, and therefore they report poor general and prostate cancer-specific quality of life. And by general quality of life, again, we mean emotional well-being, social functioning, and prostate cancer-specific quality of life is more along the lines of urinary function and sexual function. So specific to the recruitment or the target of recruitment that we have in our study, we're going to be targeting men who have been diagnosed with local or regional disease. Uh, I've provided some of the staging and the nomenclature for the TNM tumor classifications. I've asked Maria to share with you uh, some detailed tables that are available from the SCS that spell this out clearly. For our purposes today, what we want to come out with is an understanding that we're going to be recruiting in prostate cancer and colorectal cancer, survivors who've been diagnosed and treated for local and regional disease, but not for distant disease. In other words, no distant metastases. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But again, as you can see from the survival rates, the five years relative survival rate for local and regional disease in prostate cancer approximates 100%. It can range from 90 to 100 percent, depending on a variety of factors. But for the most part, it's a rate of 100 percent. 
So how do we stage prostate cancer? So stages one and two are what we call localized disease, and stage three is regional or regionally advanced disease. Stage four would be meta metastatic disease. <clears throat> I'm not going to go over all of this uh, classification system in detail because that would take uh, quite a bit of time. But if we can think of it in terms of where the cancer is and where it has advanced to, stages one and two, the cancer is completely confined to the prostate gland. What differentiates the stage one versus stage two is the aggressiveness of the cancer and the extent to which it has spread within the prostate gland. At stage three, the cancer has spread out to the outer layer of the prostate and may have spread to seminal vesicles. However, this is not considered a distant metastasis. The seminal vesicles are very near the prostate gland. And in this regional stage three classification, survival rates are fairly, fairly high. Uh, where we see a significant decrement in survival rates and we see significant changes in treatment approaches is when we're dealing with the more advanced stage four cancer, which we're not recruiting in our sample. Just to give you a graphic representation of what this would look like, here we have the prostate. This would be a very localized early stage one cancer. Stage two can be stage 2A or 2B, where the cancer is obviously a larger tumor size and may have spread to other parts of the prostate. In stage three through 3B, we have some regional advancement of uh, the prostate cancer. Uh, you may notice that in stage three in prostate cancer, we still do not have lymph node or nodal involvement. And that's because uh, the prostate is unique in the sense that there are no uh, lymph nodes very nearby the gland. So once the cancer has spread through lymph nodes in prostate cancer, that typically occurs in stage four and uh, disease and metastatic disease. And again, we're not recruiting uh, these participants into our protocols. If we look at the different treatments by stage, stage one, uh, we're seeing a growing approach of doing or conducting active, sur active surveillance, which we would not be recruiting for our sample. Uh, these are men who have a very low risk prostate cancer. The prostate cancer is not expected to grow within the next perhaps 10 to 15 years. Therefore, these men are more likely to die of other complications, particularly heart disease, or diabetes, or other comorbidities. So the approach is that these men are closely monitored uh, every three months to see if the cancer has spread or grown and if they require treatment. For cancers that are a bit more aggressive but still localized, radical plus detectomy, which is surgery, with or without radiation, is uh, it's the course of treatment. Radiation can include external beam or implant radiation or seeds. External beam, as the word implies, is a beam that radiates the prostate from without the body. For implant radiation or seeds, as some will refer to it, pellets are actually implanted into the prostate gland, which are radioactive and may need radiation to treat um, uh, the cancer and kill the cancer cells. There are some new and ongoing clinical trials with the procedure referred to as high intensity focused ultrasound or HIFU. And this procedure is still experimental. Uh, you are probably likely not to experience any survivors that have had this, but it's worth knowing because some survivors may mention this. And again, you may mention that you're aware that it's a highly experimental condition, but that uh, they should refer to their medical team if they have any detailed questions. And it basically involves emitting sound waves into the prostate that eventually destroy cancer cells. With stage two, it's the same course or treatment. I mentioned earlier that hormone treatment is becoming more and more common. And the rationale beho behind hormone treatment is that we know that prostate cancer cells grow uh, when they're infused with testosterone. So testosterone, which is a male hormone, promotes cancer tumor growth. If you give somebody an androgen deprivation treatment, that's going to wipe them out of their testosterone. And the rationale is that the cancer is not going to have testosterone available for it to grow. And uh, in a moment, I'll go over some of the side effects of that treatment. But again, it's becoming more and more common, 
for stage two and in some cases stage one prostate cancer. Stage three, typically we have external beam radiation with or without hormone treatment or radical prostatectomy with or without radiation and again some clinical trials. So as you can see, if we look at the three stages that we're recruiting, you can have a significant mix of different treatments. You may have some men who are only had surgery, men who had surgery with radiation, men who only had radiation, and then in any of those categories, they could have had hormone treatment. It's important to know that uh, the treatment is highly variable, and I'll go over some of the treatment-related side effects of these different uh, treatment approaches. In stage four prostate cancer, which we're not recruiting, these individuals typically undergo hormone therapy, again, that androgen deprivation, and chemotherapy, uh, as well as other treatments. So if we look at the prostate cancer treatment-related side effects, uh, if you look at this graph, this basically represents baseline functioning at the x-axis on a zero and time and years after diagnosis. And if you can see, sexual dysfunction is the most profound effect of any of these treatments. Urinary continence, particularly for men who had surgery, seems to be one of the, uh, the next most significant difficulty following sexual dysfunction. And then bowel dysfunction is present, but it's not as much as a problem as urinary and sexual dysfunction. And as you can see, these treatment side effects can persist well beyond treatment up to five years after uh, a diagnosis. We're going to be capturing men uh, been treated for prostate cancer within the past six months, and we're going to be getting men entering our protocol right in this critical phase where many of them are experiencing some of the most significant effects of uh, treatment. So it's important to keep that in mind. And although there will be some recovery across these different treatment side effects, the different treatment modalities, the recovery is not going to achieve baseline. Something also to keep in mind is that for radiation treatment, as you can see, the decline is not as acute, but however, it occurs slowly over time. So while men with surgery will be recovering, perhaps during the period when we're assessing them, men with radiation will continue to decline. And it's important to be aware of that because you're going to be getting different concerns, different challenges being reported, depending on the treatment type that the participant had. For us, from a statistical and a data analysis angle, we would control for that in our analyses to address those differential uh, treatment or side effect trajectories. But it's important for us, for the patient navigators, for the assessors, to be aware of this uh, variability. This is more for your information, uh, but just to point out some of the variability in treatment side effects. These are men who've had prostatectomy, and as you can see, sexual functioning and urinary continence take significant hits right away. Men with radiotherapy, uh, take uh, not a steep of, uh, of a hit in terms of functioning, and brachytherapy is also associated with several uh, treatment-related side effects. Uh, but the point here is that we do have variability across these treatments, and it's important to be aware of that. Uh, I mentioned hormone therapy a couple of times, and hormone therapy can significantly compromise quality of life in many ways. Uh, think of putting these men through a profound uh, state of menopause. They're depleted of their sexual hormone or male hormone testosterone, so they're likely to experience hot flashes, uh, anemia, cognitive difficulties, fatigue, depression, and a series of other physical changes that uh, arguably can be very compromising. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that the extent that these symptoms endure is going to be dependent on the course of treatment. So if we look again at localized disease, uh, where men may get a course of hormone treatment for a stage 2 or possibly stage, stage 1, the, the treatment side effects of hormone treatment are not going to be as challenging because they're going to get uh, several dosages over a short term of time. However, we're dealing with stage 3, they're going to get more uh, long-term treatment of androgen ablation, and they're more likely to experience those uh, side effects. So before I move on to colorectal cancer, any questions about prostate cancer? Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. So, uh, 
you can raise your virtual hand. That's going to be located in your uh, webinar control panel, as well as uh, simply typing in your uh, questions box. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sam. All right, so let's uh, move on to colorectal cancer. And colorectal cancer is also a very common cancer. Uh, so, for example, in 2009, there were 150,000 cases diagnosed and 57,000 deaths in the United States alone. It's the second most commonly diagnosed and the second and third leading causes of cancer deaths for uh, Hispanic males and females. The problem with colorectal cancer is that there is no early symptoms and screening is critical as 90% of the deaths are preventable. But the problem with screening for colorectal cancer is that colonoscopies and fecal cold blood tests are not the most desirable medical procedures that people want to undergo, understandably. There's a lot of misinformation. So people don't tend to get screened. And unfortunately, by the time that they have any symptoms related to the cancer, the cancer has advanced. So although survival for localized colorectal cancer is about 90%, only 38% of men and women present with early stage disease, which creates a challenge uh, to treat this type of cancer. Also, over 90% of the cases of colorectal cancer occur over the age of 50. So it's viewed also as primarily a disease of middle age and, and aging. Hispanics, unfortunately, are more frequently diagnosed with advanced disease, and the treatments that are available for colorectal cancer tend to be very invasive, uh, requiring surgery, radiation, chemo, and as you can expect, they can impact, <coughs> excuse me, all facets of quality life. Um, I, again, I know that all of you are aware of this, but just to revisit uh, GI anatomy, we know that the colon is an extensive organ associated with digestion. We have ascending, descending, and different parts of the colon. Many of the cancers are found in this part. Here's an image of a polyp, which you may have heard. Many of these are benign, and they're removed through a colonoscopy. But unfortunately, some of these eventually will grow into cancerous lesions. And if they're not caught in time, the cancer can spread to the wall of the intestine and eventually to other organs. So what are some of the standard treatments for colon cancer? Uh, again, like in prostate cancer, to some extent, there's a high variability of treatments that are available. It's important to understand that and get a sense of what these treatments involve. And treatments, of course, will vary depending on the stage, and we'll go over that in a moment. So surgery involves uh, a, a local excision or removal of the tumor or the polyp. Typically, it's a small lesion, and it's for localized disease. Resection involves removing a larger tumor. Uh, you may have heard of a partial colectomy, which is removal of the, uh, of the tumor and the surrounding tissue. Another term that you should be aware with in colorectal cancer is anastomosis, which is connecting healthy colon sections with one another. And I'll show you an image of that in a moment. And uh, when a resection is uh, conducted, the surrounding lymph nodes, of course, are examined to see if the disease has spread beyond uh, the, the, the colon tissue. Uh, resection and colostomy, a resection can also involve a colostomy, which occurs in the event that the two ends of the colon that are healthy uh, cannot be connected because they're too distant. In that case, a stoma or an opening is made to allow waste to pass, and that's a colostomy bag, which you may have heard of this term. As you can imagine, that is uh, it's invasive, it's not pleasant uh, to have to uh, go to work, to have to do daily activities with a colostomy bag, and that can be a potential source of uh, distress and a source of uh, challenging quality of life. Uh, radiofrequency ablation is basically inserting radioactive electrodes, which are inserted through the skin, somewhat analogous to the seed implants that I mentioned earlier in prostate cancer. And cryosurgery or cryotherapy is less commonly used, but used nonetheless. And the uh, idea here is that the tumor cells or the tumor itself can be frozen and destroyed. But again, some of the terms that you should be familiar with are polypectomy, which is removal of a polyp, which is immediately sent to pathology to determine whether it's cancerous or not. 
partial colectomy, which is involved in dissection of the colon, which involves removing the tumor and possibly the surrounding tissue, and the stomosis, which is the connecting two healthy sections of the tumor after of the colon after the tumor has been removed, and the colostomy, which is having a bag where waste can be passed. Uh, other treatments that are available in, uh, would involve chemotherapy, and as you would think, this would be for more advanced disease, or in some cases, it is provided as adjuvant treatment for localized disease. The chemotherapy can be systemic or regional uh, in an effort to stop the tumor, the tumor uh, growth. And in some cases, chemoembolization of the hepatic artery, which is the main source of, uh, that delivers uh, blood to the liver, uh, can be blocked so that uh, directly you can inject medications into the liver to fight uh, any metastasis that has occurred to the liver. We're not going to be dealing with those cases because these would be advanced cases, but it's worth understanding uh, that chemoembolization is uh, also part of some of the available treatment options for more advanced disease. Radiation therapy is also used in more advanced disease, uh, or it can also be used in adjuvant, as an adjuvant treatment for localized disease, and it could involve external radiation as in prostate cancer, or internal radiation as in uh, seeds or catheters that are placed near the tumor. And uh, targeted therapy uh, is not as commonly used, uh, more commonly used in advanced disease, and uh, these are basically antibody therapies that are given to fight uh, tumor cells. So uh, just referring to some of the uh, terms or concepts that I mentioned, uh, here we have a resection of a colon, and if the area is not significantly large, these two ends can be joined together uh, via surgery, and that's the anastomosis that I mentioned earlier. In the event that a significant portion like a large tumor such as this needs to be removed, a stoma or an opening has to be created, and a colostomy bag has to be placed so that the individual can pass the waste. As you can imagine, this is a challenging uh, type of treatment. It can uh, interfere with basically all aspects of quality of life, and in addition to that, the care of the stoma becomes critical following treatment recommendations. It's also critical to avoid complications such as infections, which are unfortunately uh, quite, quite common. So in terms of the targeted recruitment that we have for colorectal cancer, and uh, keep in mind that colon cancer and rectal cancer are two different cancers, but we refer to them together. Uh, they're very similar in terms of courses of treatment and staging. Uh, we're recruiting individuals with stages 1 through 3B. Uh, I also put up the TNM nomenclature, so tumor size of 1 to 3, nodal involvement 0 to 1, and M0. As I mentioned, Maria will send some detailed charts explaining this a little bit further, but basically we're taking individuals who have regional uh, uh, advancement but no distant metastases or distant uh, or advanced uh, disease. And if we look at the survival rates, we have quite a range depending on the stage where individuals are diagnosed ranging from 75% all the way through the lower 30s. So again, just to give you uh, an idea of what these stages may look like, uh, here's a stage 1 tumor which has developed in the colon uh, mucosa or the wall of the colon. It has spread through the submucosa and it's already beginning to invade the muscle layers, but it has not reached the serosa, which is the outer lining of the colon or uh, nearby blood vessels or lymph nodes. In stage 2, we have stage 2 through 2C, and here we have that the cancer has spread through the submucosa to the muscle layers, uh, but not the serosa or the wall, the outer wall of the colon. In stage 2B, we have uh, involvement of the cancer beyond the wall. In stage 2C, we have that the cancer has spread beyond the outer wall and may have spread to nearby organs or not, in which case we wouldn't be recruiting those patients because they would have a metastatic designation. In stage 3B, uh, we would have some involvement, again, the same process, the cancer has spread through the serosa and the outer wall, and you may have some nodal involvement in nearby tissue, but again, no, uh, the cancer has not spread to nearby 
uh, to other organs. So if we look at the treatments by stage, if we look at stage one cancer, colorectal cancer, we have uh, resection and estomosis. In stage two, we have the same with some chemotherapy clinical trials. And in stage three, we have uh, resection and estomosis with chemotherapy and some additional chemotherapeutic trials that are now available. So pretty, uh, pretty straightforward types of treatments, resection uh, and surgery only for stage one, resection and surgery only, but perhaps some chemotherapy clinical trials that are in development, and stage three, resection and estomosis with chemotherapy, and some of those chemotherapeutic trials may be investigation. With rectal cancer, we find very similar types of, uh, of uh, staging and treatment. Uh, again, stage zero, we would have a resection with internal external radiation. Uh, in stage one, I'm sorry, in stage one, we will have an excision and resection with radiation and chemotherapy before or after. In stage two, again, a resection with a combination of radiation and chemo. In stage three, it would be the same treatment as stage two with the greater dosage. So the difference between colon and rectal cancer is that in rectal cancer, you're more likely to have some chemotherapy as standard of care uh, in earlier stages because it's shown to be highly effective in preventing uh, disease progression. So what are some of the survivorship challenges in colorectal cancer? Unfortunately, unlike prostate cancer, breast, and some other cancers, and surprisingly, not a lot of attention has been given to some of the challenges in colorectal cancer. Despite that, we know that it can significantly compromise quality of life, uh, especially individuals who have to have a colostomy, individuals who have um, to undergo chemotherapy. Uh, the side effects, as I mentioned, vary significantly by type and the extent of treatment. But if we look at them specifically, surgeries associated with fatigue, constipation, and diarrhea, and some individuals can experience complications such as bleeding or infections. In a colostomy, uh, irritation of the skin around the stoma is not uncommon, and that can be complicated by infections that require antibiotic treatment and closer follow-up. And in chemotherapy, as with any uh, chemotherapeutic regimen, uh, individuals will be more susceptible to infections, uh, bruising and bleeding, fatigue, hair loss, and all the, the challenges associated with chemotherapy and radiation as well leads to some significant uh, treatment-related side effects. Uh, this is a nice chart showing some of the short and long-term uh, effects of uh, treatments for colorectal cancer. Um, you find that the short term, you find a lot of um, bowel dysfunction, uh, or urinary dysfunction, the diarrhea, the constipation. And many of these also persist during the long term, during the short term, but also can persist well beyond three years after treatment, including male sexual dysfunction and female sexual dysfunction. So again, not a lot of psychosocial and quality of life research has been geared towards understanding the effects of treatment for colorectal cancer, uh, particularly the psychological distress involved in it. But definitely, we know that there are significant challenges uh, that these survivors face after treatment that can be uh, compromising. Some of the few studies that have been conducted have documented, as you can expect, significantly lower functional scores across multiple uh, domains in colorectal cancer patients relative to the general population. So looking at general functioning like physical, role, emotional, cognitive, and social, we find across the board that colorectal cancers who are depicted by the lighter uh, bars have uh, more compromises. If we look at treatment-related side effects, again, as you would expect relative to a general population, we find significant challenges, particularly fatigue, insomnia, constipation, diarrhea among colorectal cancer uh, survivors. So I will stop here. I'll be glad to answer any questions. I hope that this gives you a general overview of both prostate and colorectal cancer. Uh, I know this is quite a bit of information and uh, that a lot of details were not covered, but I think this will provide you with a general working knowledge of uh, both uh, C sites. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to share with you more information for your own reading. And uh, I'd be glad to take any questions now or if at any point uh, you would like to contact me, I'll also be glad to answer your questions.
So if they are on I have a question. This is by the way. So for the if they are on a clinical trial, is that considered part of your treatment? Are we gonna call patients that are on clinical trial? No, we we shouldn't. We shouldn't treatment. call them and we should document that they're in a clinical trial. Uh, I, there really shouldn't be a reason to accept them. Okay. Thank you. And what you're going to find is that in prostate cancer, many of the clinical trials would involve uh, different courses of treatment with androgen ablation therapy, and in colorectal will be different chemotherapeutic agents. Oh, okay. Dr. Fernando, this, this is Sandra. Um, going back to the recruitment criteria, so for prostate cancer um, survivors, are we sticking to um, just patients with surgery at the moment or um, including also those in additional treatment? Yeah, so we had originally conceptualized this as trying to target a very specific population. And uh, one of the challenges in that is recruitment, as you know, that's always a challenge for us. And uh, talking with Emily, talking with uh, Dr. Hare at the NCI, the sense that we got is that they would like us to be a bit more inclusive and spread our recruitment out to a greater population. So I would say that at this point we would recruit both surgery and radiation, and that we would address that uh, statistically when we analyze the data. Okay, great. Thank you for clarifying that. You're welcome. Are there any additional comments or questions? Okay, so we'll move to the emergency protocol training. Dr. Panetta, let me know when you're ready and I will um, send you the prompt again so we can see your screen. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. See the screen? Yes, sir. All you need to do is put it in slideshow mode and you'll be good to go. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to the second part of the training. And um, through our discussions, we've identified a need for training in enacting emergency procedures for the various reasons that I just covered uh, when we discussed both prostate and colorectal. Uh, we do expect to experience some individuals who may have significant challenges in terms of their emotional well-being. It is not going to be common and it's going to be rare, but nonetheless, we have to be prepared uh, to be able to work with these survivors in an effectively and uh, in an effective manner. So part of the challenges that, that we have to deal with when working with trying to determine emergencies and how to address them, is that uh, the aspect of uh, dealing with any emergency does require a uh, judgment on the part of the patient navigator, cooperation or consultation with the project manager, and in some cases with the PI. The challenge that we have is that we're not giving any measures that are clinically diagnostic. So we're not giving like a suicidality measure or a clinical depression measure or clinical anxiety measure. So we have to rely on what the survivor tells us. And from there, we have to uh, make our judgments to determine whether we have to enact uh, these uh, emergency uh, procedures. Uh, I also realized that the groups that we have have a lot of degree of, a lot of variability in terms of their training and experience with these. Uh, some people may have already been trained in some of these emergency procedures. This may be new to others. So some of this information may be repetitive, but nonetheless, uh, bear with me so that we can uh, make sure that uh, we present this to, to our entire team and that we're all on the same page in terms of how to address emergencies that we may encounter. So let me just give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, we're going to talk about emergency protocols, why we need them, when we should implement them, and how. 
uh, very few comments on the psychological experience in cancer survivorship. We'll talk about suicidality, and that will be where we spend most of the time because it is likely to be the one emergency that we will encounter. Uh, we'll also talk about how do we determine imminent risk uh, in these cases, how do we intervene, what dispositions we need to make, and then we'll talk a little bit about abuse and neglect, domestic violence, and intoxication, which uh, we're mandated by our IRBs to, uh, to react and respond to any reports of uh, these uh, events. So uh, why do we have emergency procedures in place? Well, we're ethically bound to address emergencies in a professional and competent manner. Remember, we're opening the doors for a patient population to interact with us. And the RB mandates practice, practices that need to be followed for protecting any research with human subjects. Uh, we have general recommendations on how to handle suicidal homicidal behavior and reports of abuse and neglect. And these, of course, are going to vary depending on the site and uh, on the rules that your IRB imposes. But these general guidelines are useful and they're generalizable to any um, of those sites. So <clears throat> what are some of the circumstances that require enactment of emergency protocols, writing an incident report, and consulting with the project manager or with the study PI or with medical staff. These involve suicidality, which is likely the one that we would encounter at some point, homicidality or threat to harm somebody else, child abuse, elder dependent abuse, intoxication upon arrival to the clinic, or any situation where participant safety or safety of others is compromised. I can tell you that in our site, we just completed a couple of studies where we assessed, uh, we conducted a total of 5,280 assessments and uh, among Hispanic uh, population here in the Miami uh, community, and uh, we had probably a handful of suicidal cases, and we didn't have to address any cases of homicidality. We had a few child abuse some elder and dependent abuse, but there were very, very few. So the point is that this is extremely rare, but nonetheless, we have to be prepared. So we all know the psychosocial challenges of cancer survivorship. It's a chronic disease. Despite the significant advances we have in treatment efficacy and the high survival rates, the long-term side effects that are associated with treatment can create psychological and emotional challenges. In addition to that, we're going to be working particularly in prostate cancer with older populations that have comorbidities, that have functional designs, uh, declines, and they may be experiencing mild to severe levels of psychological distress, mostly associated with interpersonal disruption and caregiver challenges uh, that they may be experiencing with their support system. So if we look at psychological distress in cancer, uh, we can say that it involves having an unpleasant emotional reaction that can affect functioning in several domains. And these domains can be psychological functioning, social functioning, and spiritual functioning. A way to think of this in terms of a reaction is that individuals range from very common normal feelings of vulnerability, sadness, and fear, all the way to clinical levels of depression, anxiety, social isolation, having an existential crisis where the individual reevaluates his or her place in life. And as you would imagine, at this end of the continuum, uh, individuals are going to be more likely to experience distress at a level that may warrant psychological treatment. So while today we're going to focus on emergencies like suicidality, homicidality, it's also important to keep in mind that some of our patients may be expressing significant levels of depression and anxiety that may warrant some sort of referral. I know that we've put together referral lists for our sites for these individuals, and certainly the LAF will provide some mitigation services for individuals who uh, voice uh, these concerns. But for today's purpose, what we're really interested is in dealing with how do we address individuals who are really at the end of this continuum where they become suicidal or they are facing other extreme challenges. Individuals, or most individuals, that range from common reactions all the way through where we get into the red zone are dealing with 
typical adjustment disorders leading to a diagnosis and treatment of cancer. And for the most part, these individuals will return to baseline levels of emotional functioning within one or two years after their treatment. So let's look closer at the populations that we're working with. This is a landmark study back in 2001, which documented significant levels of distress by cancer site. And as you would imagine, lung cancer and brain cancer, given the, the challenging disease course and the low survival rates, uh, are the populations that experience the greater percentage of significant levels of distress, clinical depression and clinical anxiety. Looking at our population, prostate cancer is one of the lowest, if not the lowest, with about 30% of our population experiencing significant levels of distress, with very similar rates for colorectal and breast cancer. So we can view this in a way as thinking that about a third of the patients that we uh, may encounter may be experiencing some significant level of distress. That doesn't mean they're going to be suicidal, that doesn't mean they need treatment, but it will come up and it will be discussed while you interact with them through the navigation. So let's begin with suicidality. Uh, suicidality is more common than we actually think. So it's relatively rare, uh, particularly in a research study, but it's a more common phenomenon that one, seems, one thinks about from day to day. It is the 11th leading cause of death in the United States. In 2006, there were about 32,000 deaths, or, that, or that's more about 81 deaths per day or one American in every 16 minutes. Males are at greater risk of committing suicide. The male to female ratio is 4 to 1, and over 50% of suicides occur by firearms. White men have the highest risk. Uh, Latino men and Latino women have some of the lowest risks of suicide unless you're looking at Latina with uh, adolescent women who have a very high risk as well. Uh, again, the younger, the very young, and the very old tend to have the highest rates of uh, suicide. If we look at uh, <clears throat> suicide ideation, which is the idea or the thinking that life is not worth living, I may be better off dead, what is all this worth, I, if I, I'm dead I'm not going to have to deal with my problems, is what we refer to as suicidal ideation. Uh, so suicide ideation is fairly common. Uh, suicide uh, attempts are also fairly common as well. So if we look at ideation, about 14% of individuals, and this is the general population, tend to have some sort of ideation in their lifetime. At some point or another, they've said, life is not worth living, I'm better off dead. About 4% have actually developed or thought about a plan. And there we start to get into a little bit more of an issue, because one thing is to say, oh, I'm better off dead, life is not worth living, and then move on with your life or with your activities. Another thing is to say life is not worth living, and why don't I just take a bottle of sleeping pills and down it with some alcohol, and that'll be the end of it. These are two very different concepts. One is suicidal ideation without a plan. The other one, the individual has gone to the next level where they've actually thought of a way of doing, of taking their lives. And finally, 0.1% of the population will actually commit suicide. Again, it looks like a very small number, but it's more common in terms of rates. Remember, it's the 11th cause, leading cause of death in the U.S., and in one year, we experienced about 30,000 suicides in the United States alone. <clears throat> so what are some of the suicide risk factors? Uh, we know that being a male, widowed, divorced, older, and non being non-Hispanic white uh, creates a greater risk. Uh, in terms of psychosocial factors, being socially isolated, unemployed, or facing financial stress creates more of a risk. Having a psychiatric illness, uh, like a clinical depression, uh, psychotic disorder, or falling to substance abuse or dependence is a risk factor. And physical illnesses also create a greater risk of suicide, heart cancer, HIV, renal failure, or central nervous system disorders. There's a whole set of other factors, such as psychological factors, like um, being depressed and hopeful about the future, having low self-esteem, being impulsive and aggressive. Uh, a history of trauma can also be a risk factor. And of course, there's genetic and familial factors, like having a family history, 
uh, have a mental Ill illness in the family or abuse. But what are the major risk factors? What is it that we need to uh, look at if we put all of this together? Psychopathology is a major risk factor. You're dealing with a survivor who is telling you that they've been depressed all their life, that they've been dealing with major depression, that they've received a diagnosis, that they've been treated, and they've been taking antidepressants. That is a major risk factor. Existing psychopathology is associated with about 90% of all suicides. So people that are doing fairly well and don't have a history of mental illness, it's rare for them to commit suicide. And typically those individuals will do it as a reaction to a major life event. But individuals who have a history of psychopathology, they're more likely to be at risk. Something that is very also very important to look out for are prior attempts of suicide. Somebody who has had a prior attempt has 40 times the risk of committing suicide than somebody who has not. So if a person in the clinic tells you, I'm clinically depressed, I've been treated all my life, I'm under medications, and I'm starting to think that life is not worth living, relative to somebody who tells you all that and says, and 10 years ago I had an attempt, that person who tells you that they had the prior attempt is going to be at a significantly greater risk. Suicide and flags have to go up in terms of doing a more thorough assessment, and we're going to talk about that. And of course, substance abuse increases the risk in combination with any mental condition or reduction. Family history is also important. History of suicide in the family, major stressors that are family related, and poor functioning within the family, particularly for Hispanic and other ethnic minorities. If we look at the relative risk of mental health risk factors. Again, prior suicide attempt also is at the top with a very high risk. Eating disorders, bipolar disorder, major depression, drug use, dysthymia, OCD, these are all high risk disorders. Cancer, I listed it down here. The, it's a two, it, it, the cancer itself confers a 2% risk of suicidality. So again, it looks very rare, and it will be very rare within our sample, but nonetheless, it's present. It needs to be taken into consideration. So what are some of the suicide warning signs? Uh, you know, one, one thing that we tend to think is that people uh, engage in what we call parasuicidal behavior. Uh, these are typically individuals who are not serious about committing suicide, so they will make some overtures, they'll make some comments, or they're trying to get attention. For our purposes today, it's important to understand that that phenomenon or that presentation of suicidality, one which involves individuals saying, I'm, I, I, I'm thinking of taking my life or I'm going to take a, a bottle of sleeping pills just to get attention, is extremely uncommon in our population. This is something that you see in teenagers, individuals between the ages of 15 and 18, possibly even 21 particularly those who are developing uh, personality disorders. In our circumstances, dealing with cancer survivors, adults, mostly over the age of 50, suicide warning signs are real. They're not typically gestures to get attention, but rather warning signs that there's something taking place, and they have to be taken very seriously. So as you would expect, suicide notes, direct and indirect threats about committing suicide, making final arrangements, giving away possessions, talking about death, being hopeless or helpless, withdrawing socially, loss of interest in activities, and sudden personality changes are all warning signs that uh, should get our attention. One way of looking at this is uh, using the mnemonic sad persons. Um, as it, uh, it actually lists, if, if you spell out sad persons, you can look at many of these risk factors. Sex, we know that being male, age being older, having a history of depression, previous attempt, alcohol use, thinking rational, uh, irrationally about uh, events in, in the survivor's life, lack of social support, having an organized plan, having no spouse, having widow, divorce, or single, particularly for men, or having a physical illness, which in our case all our uh, participants will have cancer. These are all significant risk factors. Uh, for suicidality. 
what are some of the protective factors? So in addition to the risk factors, there's also several uh, protective factors, and these are important to consider because at some point, when the individual mentions that they've been thinking about taking their death, uh, their life, they've been thinking about death, uh, you're going to have to assess whether the risk of suicidality is imminent or not. And part of that involves trying to understand what would prevent this individual from committing suicide. So some of the protective factors are having children at home. Uh, that doesn't apply to postpartum psychosis, but, but it is protective for most individuals. Uh, being pregnant, having good social support, adequate coping strategies, uh, having reality testing, meaning that the person has not lost touch with reality, um, uh, deterring religious beliefs, somebody who's highly religious and spiritual is less likely to commit suicide, having general life satisfaction, and being in treatment or therapy for a psychological condition can all serve as protective factors. Now, what are the challenges in assessing suicide risk? And the challenge for us is that we don't have uh, an assessment measure, and there's really no assessment measure that is sensitive enough to predict suicides or avoid what we call false positives. People who say, I will take my life, but uh, actually don't do it. So prediction is really impossible because of the low base rate and the multiple risk factors that are involved that can change over time and circumstances. So our challenge is that we have no systematic assessment of these circumstances. We have to depend on the spontaneous comments that, uh, or observable, observable behavior that uh, the individual makes during the interview, during the patient navigation interactions. And the comments are more likely to arise during administration of several of the measures, when we're talking about depression, about worry, about quality of life, about symptoms. That's where individuals are more likely to say, this is so challenging for me, the sexual dysfunction is so frustrating that I, I'm starting to think that life is not worth living. So we have to be cognizant of the fact that these comments are more likely to arise in certain parts of our interaction, but keep in mind that they can occur at any time. So what are some of these spontaneous comments that the participant uh, may express? So they may or may not be indicative of suicidality, but we have to err on the side of caution. We have to assume that the participant is being serious and is trying to convey a message. So some of the comments include, as I mentioned before, life is not worth living, I'm better off dead, no one will miss me. Once these comments are made, it's really our responsibility to assess the imminence and dangerousness of the comments. Is this for real? Is the person really talking about taking their life and are they going to enact on this? So let's make a distinction. Uh, so let's talk about how do we determine immediate risk. So a suicidal threat, so let's say that the person says that uh, life is not worth living, I'm thinking of taking my life. A threat is judged to be imminent if the participant cannot categorically state that he or she will not hurt himself. So. In, in, in this case, it's an imminent risk that requires immediate intervention, and we're going to talk about what that intervention may be. A threat is judged to be significant if the participant cannot categorically state that he or she would never take his or her life, but would not act upon it immediately. So they've told you, I cannot guarantee that I would not hurt myself, but I would not do this immediately. This requires further assessment and, again, clear disposition. That's a high in contrast to somebody who says, I would never hurt myself, I would not do that to my children, that's again my, against my faith, I just say it, but would never hurt myself. So notice the distinction here, that individual is clearly saying categorically that they're not going to take their life, they're not going to hurt themselves. So it's really critical that that is what we hear from a participant in the document in order to determine that there's no imminent risk of suicidality. I'm not going to go over this next slide, uh, but it's useful, again, in determining what are some of the, the, the issues regarding uh, the, the imminence of the risk and whether the risk is immediate or not. So what do we ask? Uh, when the participant raises the issue of suicidality, uh, there are several questions that we have to ask, and I know that we've put together a suicidality protocol with many of these questions that you can easily follow when you're uh, assessing for the risk of suicidality. 
So <clears throat> some of the questions involve, have you felt suicidal in the past? This establishes whether there's a pattern of ideation in the past, and this is common behavior for the individual. Uh, you want to ask, when was the last time that you felt suicidal before today to address if there's a recent event that's triggering suicidal ideation and possible intent? Could it be that the individual has just been told that their cancer has progressed and they develop metastases? Could it be that they've lost a loved one? In other words, what's changed in their life that's making them suicidal? Uh, you want to also ask if the individual is feeling suicidal right now to determine whether this is imminent and clearly ask, will you take your life? You must be very direct in the questioning. This is the time to forget uh, sensitivities about phrasing questions. This is the one place where you have to be very, very direct and clearly ask, will you take your life? So how do you ask uh, these questions? These are always difficult issues to cover, and uh, individuals and participants can be very savvy at being evasive and avoiding of uh, answering the questions directly because they're difficult topics. And it's also difficult for us on our end to try to ascertain whether the individual is serious about suicidality because we know that that's going to have a set a series of consequences that we have to undertake. So an indirect uh, way of asking about suicidality is saying something like, you're not thinking of hurting yourself, are you? That can elicit a very easy no, and that's the end. And you would not find more information from the participant when, in fact, they may be suicidal. A better but not direct enough way would be, are you thinking of harming yourself? Again, the individual would say no. A, be a better approach and a direct approach would be, Sometimes when someone has thoughts of suicide and makes comments about taking his or her life, they will do it. Is this something that you're thinking about? If the individual says yes, you will ask directly, will you take your life? Again, a very, very direct approach. Some participants will not give you a direct answer. Uh, you have to do your best in trying to elicit information from them, whether it's framing it this way, or asking by saying, I'm curious why you mentioned it, and you're saying that you would not hurt yourself. So the more information you can gather from the participant, the more you're going to have to work with in making the right uh, disposition. So what do you do if the risk is immediate? Uh, if the person has an active ideation with a plan, basically they've told you, yes, I want to hurt myself, and I cannot guarantee my safety, and I've actually thought of I'm going to do it, going to use a gun that's in the house, or I'm going to take pills, or overdose on pills. The participant at that point cannot be left alone. You have to contact the project uh, manager, or the PI, or a staff physician at the site, or someone that uh, you can consult with. I know this varies by site, depending whether the participant is in Miami, at uh, Texas, or with the LAF over the phone. And I trust that the LAF has their own procedures to address this. But more relevant to the Miami and Texas sites, the participant has to be assessed at that point by a PhD or MD level staff person. Per the Miami protocol, if it's different in Texas, that's fine. For us, we're mandated that a PhD level or an MD level staff member, whether or not they're directly associated with the project, further assess the individual. Uh, the individual may need to be taken to the nearest emergency room, mental health clinic with the health services, or you may have to call 911 and inform the police that you have a participant under this sort of protocol that cannot guarantee their safety and are saying that they're going to commit suicide. So as you can see, this is a very serious situation. It's very unpleasant uh, for both the assessor, the navigator, and the participant, and great, great care has to be taken to make sure that all the steps are followed um, adequately. So when you have these immediate risk situations, uh, the incident report has to be filed and documented within 12 hours of the incident, again, by Miami IRB uh, regulations. It might be a little bit different in Texas. The incident report has to document the circumstance reported and the action taken by the study personnel. And if personnel other than the PI is involved in the incident, the PI must be informed of the incident within. 24 hours, somewhat similar to the reporting of adverse events.
So that's one extreme situation, and I'll show you how to document this in a note in a future slide. But what about no immediate risk situations, something like passive ideation? The assessor has to contact the project manager or PI prior to the participant departure. The assessor or the navigator should not handle this on their own. Uh, the participant has voiced passive ideation. They've talked about suicidality. You want to make sure you have a second person that you're consulting with, preferably the project manager or the PI, um, to help you make the disposition and document the note adequately. The incident reporter, the clinical note, has to be found documented within 12 hours of the incident, again, documenting the circumstance reported and the action taken by the study personnel. If only the project manager was contacted, the PI has to be notified within 24 hours of the incident, again, as an adverse event. So how do you document these incident reports? And this is critical because this is, in a sense, the backup that we have for our assessors, for our navigators, that we did the right thing, that we followed all the steps uh, to adequately deal with the situation. So the report has to include the nature of the circumstance that prompted the action, whether it was suicidal ideation or abuse. Uh, we'll talk about abuse in a moment if time allows. Uh, we have to have a detailed but yet brief description of the event so that we can adequately communicate the nature and severity of the circumstances. What was it that happened? What did the participants say? Why, uh, did, why are they feeling uh, suicidal or they've had the passive ideation? And what did you do? This position taking is critical because it says, how did you intervene in this? Did you provide a, provide a referral to the community? Did you walk a participant to the emergency room? So a referral to community services would be for somebody who has passive ideation. They tell you that they thought about it, but they can tell you that they're not going to enact on it. Walking a participant to an emergency room or calling 911 will be for somebody who has an immediate risk, are willing to act on it, and not guarantee their safety. We always have to also have follow-up. We have to call the participant between the 24 hours uh, after seeing uh, or, or interacting with them to make sure they have followed up on the plan that was given to them. With abuse uh, reports, we, we have to follow up with agencies that we have to report to. And the incident reports and follow-up reports have also need to be co-signed by the project manager or PI. Again, you have to have somebody else involved in this process uh, as a backup. Um, in the incident report, you also want to be clear about what the participant reported to warrant further assessment, how the participant was assessed, what conclusions were drawn, who was consulted, and what was done to protect the participant's well-being, again, the disposition. Did they, were they given a list of referrals? Were they walked to an emergency room uh, with somebody in their uh, network contact? Uh, I'm not going to go over the notes uh, in detail, but I did want to include them so you have an idea of a suicide ideation report for passive presentation versus one for active. And uh, if we look at the passive, the plan of disposition, uh, we want to make sure that we document that the participants encouraged to contact whether they have a prior therapist, that we give referrals to the community, and that you're making a follow-up within 24 hours. In the active uh, scenario, the participant is informed of the severity and escorted to an emergency room where he or she was provided with immediate medical attention. A family member was contacted, follow up call is made within 24 hours. So again, the, the extent of your response and intervention varies on whether the ideation is active or passive. Uh, some additional comments on suicidality, uh, suicide ideation and attempts more common than we think, but they will be rare in our particular study. Actual suicidality is rare, but unfortunately it does happen, and it is our responsibility to err on the side of caution. If we're suspicious, we have to assess risk or danger. Uh, you have to be clear in your note, assessors and navigators do not make the determination or intervention on their own. The project manager, PI, where any medical staff has to work with the assessors in establishing a disposition. Ultimately, the responsibility lies with the site PI uh, and or the MD level staff that assist you. 
So I'm not going to talk about threats to others in the interest of time or uh, the other emergency situations because they're so extremely rare. But I did want to wrap this up with uh, going over a flowchart that I believe has been shared with all the sites. And this is something that has worked well for us, a sort of uh, uh, a pathway of how to intervene uh, in each uh, different scenario. And again, the cases that we're very likely to experience are suicidality. And we have what needs to happen depending on whether it's immediate, meaning that the person has a plan and active ideation and cannot contract for their safety. Significant, where a person says that I will not act upon it immediately, but cannot guarantee that they will not do it in the future. Or passive, where there's really no intent or plan. And the individual has just had some thoughts, but they're not going to act on them. So as you can imagine, these two are the ones that become more complex and require uh, very thoughtful and detailed thinking through the whole process, making sure you engage other individuals so that you have the adequate disposition in these cases. In, ter in terms of homicidality, uh, abuse, domestic violence, and intoxication, uh, we have specific uh, guidelines that we follow depending on the regulations in the state law. So these will, to some extent, vary by site. Uh, for example, in Florida, uh, we have to report child and elder abuse and neglect uh, to the agency uh, immediately, something that we're bound to do by the law. Paradoxically, in domestic violence, we don't have to report it. Uh, we have to encourage the participant to report the case. Um, so again, I'm not going to go over these because these vary by site, but keep in mind that you may have some individuals who come in and will tell you that they have thoughts of harming somebody else. And that's something that needs to be monitored. And there's several slides within this presentation which will, will be shared with everyone on how to address that. Uh, we have to be aware of child and elder abuse and neglect. Some of those participants who freely volunteer that they've experienced or uh, observed uh, this type of abuse. Domestic violence is unfortunate, uh, unfortunately a problem that some participants may face. And again, we need to follow adequate responses to those reports. And finally, intoxication, again, very likely to be a rare event with our patient population. But we have to make sure that if we have reason to suspect that the participant is intoxicated, obviously they cannot participate in the study activities. We have to contact the project manager for consultation and assess the needs and uh, provide relevant so uh, with that, I'll stop, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, again, as with the cancer information, I am willing to be available once we start recruiting, uh, assessing, and conducting our patient navigation activities to assist with emergencies uh, such as, the, as these, because I know that these cases are complicated, and it's kind of difficult to, to provide examples because there's such a high degree of variability in these presentations that uh, one, from one case to another, they can be completely different. So again, I'm willing to assist uh, the research team in dealing with these events. So I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have at this point. Thank you, Dr. Pinedo. Are there any questions or comments at this time? Okay, so thank you everybody for your time. I know that uh, Maria will be uh, distributing a few documents uh, specific to the presentations today, and uh, we'll be talking again tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Panina. All right, bye everyone. Thank you. I just wanted to thank Dr. Panetto for the wonderful presentations and trainings uh, given today. Um, I just want to also mention that we have emergency protocols in place for both study sites in San Antonio, Texas, and Miami. And um, we are looking forward to the second part of the training, which is taking place tomorrow starting at 9 a.m. Central Standard Time. Excellent. 
Well, I'd like to thank all um, everyone today for joining us, and we do look forward to everyone joining us tomorrow at 9 a.m. Central for the uh, second part of the Redis in Action training. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.